What is up, everybody? Mr. Purse here. Welcome to Unit One, Part One, The World in 1750. This is our first video for the global regents for 10th grade. This is supposed to pick up where you left off in ninth grade, depending upon where you did leave off. But we're really looking at the end of age of exploration, of European exploration, kind of go out and conquer the world. While you're watching these videos, highly suggest that you take notes. You can either type into a review sheet, write into a review sheet, take notes on the side. Don't just try and listen and process, but you can if you want. Um, just my suggestion is to take some notes while you're doing this. It makes everything so much easier later on. But let's get rocking and rolling here. Here's the deal. So 1750, um, it's kind of a marking point of a lot of changes that are going to happen in the world. So we're kind of looking at around the world in 1750. I personally hate this first little section here. Um, New York State decided to put it in. So I'm going to try and go through this as quick as possible, as painless as possible. There's a couple major terms in here that are going to come up not only in this unit, but moving forward. Maybe you've heard of them, maybe you haven't, but I put them in here just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, this time period is going to be very centralized in terms of government. And what that means when you hear centralized is power is in the center or in the middle. And in this case, power is in the cent is centered in a lot of the areas around the world in 1750 in the hands of one person or a very small group of people. We're not talking about democratic governments yet. We're not talking about elections that allow a large group of 500 uh, representatives to rule over a group of people. We're talking about very centralized and the power is centered in one place or in one, one group of people. Um, most of these rulers at this time around 1750 are absolute rulers. Absolute means total, 100%. So these are absolute rulers or people who have complete control over their people. So you have these kings or these queens or these emperors or these sultans or whatever word you want to use where they have total control over everybody. They decide everything what you can make, what you can sell, how much things cost, how much you're going to be taxed. And they decided and if you don't like it, you, there's not much you can do because the power is centered in their hands. So these are absolute rulers. So I'm going to go through a couple of these places. There's four of them all together. And just so you know where we're going here, we're going to go here into India. We're going to go over to Japan um, and into China. So we're going to kind of bounce around the Ottoman Empire here. We're going to bounce around a little bit. I'm going to try and make this as quick and as painless as possible. But the first place we're looking at is the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire is right here on the Mediterranean Sea. If you are horrible with geography, um, most people at least know that Italy is the boot. So if you're ever looking at Europe, North uh, Africa, uh, Southwest Asia, you know that the boot's here. So it kind of gives you a little perspective. So right next to the boot is the Adriatic Sea. And this is where the Ottoman Empire, this is where the Ottoman Empire was, um, formed at the time from the 1300s to the 1900s. The ruler of the Ottoman Empire is guess what kind of ruler? He is an absolute monarch, meaning he has total control. Now, just because you have total control doesn't mean you're a jerk and no one likes you when you do horrible things, although sometimes you do. Um, but in this case, there's some good stuff that the Ottoman Sultan did and the Ottoman Sultans throughout the Ottoman Empire did. One is they did practice religious toleration, meaning that they were a diverse empire. They are all the way across. They're on three different continents. There's a lot of different types of people there. They do allow toleration of religion, which you're going to see a theme of kind of going one way or the other on this in a second. Um but they do pr practice toleration. So Christians, Jewish people were allowed to practice their faith freely, which we don't see in other parts of the world at this time necessarily. Also, they are the center of trade. This is a huge trade area. It's the Mediterranean Sea. There's a lot going on here. There's a, been a lot of trade since the Roman and the Greek Empire, which you should have learned about last year. And there's a lot of stuff going on here where there's trade and it's active and they are the center of that trade. And as a result of that trade, you are able to increase power. So the Ottoman Empire is one of our places. Our second place is called the Mughal Empire. That is down here in India. Now, here's the trick about this place. In India today and back in the 1500s and back in the 100s and back in the BCE era before, you know, way back in the day, it is primarily Hindu. Most people who live there are Hindu. That is their religion. That's their belief. However, the Mughal Empire is not Hindu. They are a group of Muslims from Central Asia who come in and invade this area and successfully rule for over 300 years. To rule over a Hindu population when you are Muslim, you kind of have two options. Either you just try and force everyone to convert or you practice religious toleration. And because Hinduism is so ingrained in the culture here with the caste system and a lot of the beliefs locally and throughout this subcontinent, they decide that they are going to practice religious toleration instead of forcing Hindus to convert to Islam. So they allow Hindus to practice freely. They don't force them to convert to Islam. And many of the government officials who are allowed to be part of the government are going to be Hindu. So even though the Muslim, um, the, the Mughals are primarily Muslim, they do allow Hindus to practice freely. So very similar to the Ottoman Empire, 
which is the Ottomans and the Mughals are both allow religious toleration. Also very similar to the Ottoman Empire, they're the center of trade. This area in the Indian Ocean is a huge trade center. It's where when the Europeans were going out to explore in the 14 and 1500s, this is where they were trying to get to. It's the center of trade, what they wanted to get to, um, a lot of activity in this region, and it's been that way for, for centuries at this point. The next place we're going to jump over to, we're kind of going across the, the map here, is the Tokugawa Shogunate. Um, it is located in Japan. Uh, the leader, the, the Shogun is the leader. He is a absolute ruler. Um, he is making the decisions, and he is from the Tokugawa family. That's where we get that name, um, Tokugawa Shogunate, which basically means the Tokugawa Empire. Um, one thing that he does and one thing that they do is they are going to force local nobles to come and live at their palace in Edo. Um, and they're going to force, which is the capital, they're going to force them to live there a couple months out of the year. And the idea is this, if I'm the if I'm the shogun, who is my biggest threat to power? It's the other people who have money and power, and they are the nobles. So they're going to say, hey, nobles, you got to come and live here a couple months out of the year. And that way I can kind of keep an eye on you. But also we get to hang out and you might realize, yo, I'm not such a bad dude. And since we're cool and since we hang out, I, you're less of a threat to my power. Also, if you are a threat to my power and you kind of suck, I'm going to know that you are not ideally a person I went around and I might now have a little insight on how to topple you as a noble. So it gives me power, gives me a little bit of control. Also, kind of a different from what we see in the Ottoman and the Mughals, if you're seeing I'm doing a lot of comparing here, different between the Ottoman and the Mughals, the Tokugawa Shogunate severely, strictly, harshly limits trade. They do not allow anyone to come in. And this is a time of a lot of European exploration, a lot of people from different parts of the world, a lot of mistrust and lack of trust with, the, with people who are coming in. Um, and they only allow a group of people called the Dutch, who are from the Netherlands and Europe, the Chinese, which is right over here, and the Koreans to come in and trade. Everyone else you're not allowed in. Um, the beauty of this system is there's not a lot of war going on. People aren't trying to invade them because they kind of know better at this point. And they're so isolated, it's so hard to get across here because it's an archipelago, which is a chain of islands. Um, and as a result of this, there's no war. So one thing that ends up happening is the samurai warriors, um, which hopefully you learned about last year, the samurai warriors um, are now gonna become government officials. They don't need to fight anybody. There's, it's peace, peace time in, in Tokugawa in the Shogunate, pretty sweet. Um, last one, and we'll get more into this in class a little bit, but uh, the last one is uh, the French empire. They are known as the the Bourbon or the Bourbon dynasty. Uh, it's the family name. They are going to be in power in France until the French Revolution, which happens in 1789, but 1792 is when the king loses his head, but more to come on that later. They are super strict. So again, comparison, right? Mughal, Ottoman, religiously tolerant. The French empire under the Bourbon dynasty, not religiously tolerant. If you are not Catholic, you are not allowed in the country. And there's a very limiting, and a lot of wars are fought over this between Protestants and Catholics, and there's a little Muslim population. There's all kinds of issues. One thing that they do that the king does is he does build a huge palace. And if you ever go to Paris, you should check out the Palace of Versailles. It's a couple miles outside of Paris. Um, it is a huge palace. And similar to the Tokugawa Shogunate, they force the nobles to come live, even though it's a totally different, all the way across the world from where Japan is, same concept and idea. We're going to make the nobles come in. We're going to make them hang out for a few months out of the year so we can kind of get, keep our eye on them. And hopefully they start liking us. But if we don't like them, we know not to trust them. And we keep our enemies close, friends close, enemies closer. That's what I'm looking for. Um, and last piece of this, it, these are a couple, one thing when you get money, when you get power and you get the respect, you try and build things to show off your wealth. And these are just a couple examples of that. This is in uh, the Mughal Empire, the Ottoman Empire. This is in Japan. And uh, this is the Palace of Versailles in France. So they're these wealthy, absolute monarchs who are trying to centralize their power, look at me coming full circle all the way in the center, um, are going to try and centralize their power.